we're going to start a new unit on computational learning theory now. And this is, in some sense, a discussion about, think of it as the laws of nature about machine learning. If there were laws of nature about learnability, what might they look like? This is a topic that you may not encounter outside of a machine learning class. So, and kind of fun. It's really fun. There's no programming or anything, but there's a lot of heavy math. So it's all good. Uh, just to kind of step back and see where we are. Um, we are still, we, we are talking about supervised learning and uh, all the learning theory stuff that we'll encounter will also be about supervised learning. Where we looked at uh, what instances are, instances are things that are inputs to learning programs. Concepts are the true function that we would like to learn that's hidden from us. And the hypotheses are functions that our learner tries out in some sense to uh, identify or discover the underlying concept. All learning algorithms that we have, we've seen so far, and we will probably encounter only these kinds in the class. Uh, take this uh, shape. The learning algorithm ingests some labeled data and it produces a hypothesis. Uh, more, common, uh, more commonly, the word model is used to refer to that. So let's call that thing H. We have a model H. And this model is a function. Given new examples, this model can make predictions for that new example. We've looked at a few specific learning algorithms, uh, decision trees and perceptrons, uh, which can produce these sorts of hypotheses given training data. We also looked at least mean square regression, but I'm deliberately not putting it here because it's a regression thing and all the learning theory stuff typically uh, that we will encounter deals with uh, classification. So let's focus on that. But we've also seen a few other general ideas associated with machine learning. We looked at the idea of what it means for uh, uh, examples to be represented or instances to be represented in high dimensional spaces as feature vectors. And hopefully you're kind of getting comfortable with that idea now because you've seen that for a while, you've been playing with that idea in your homework and you are looking at feature vectors. Uh, and in your homework, you have some 38 or something features, right? So whether you like it or not, you're working in a 38 dimensional space. I encourage you not to imagine a 38 dimensional space, but because that's just a way to get a headache, but uh, you know, you're working with high dimensional features. We looked at this uh, notion of overfitting when we looked at uh, decision trees. Overfitting is when the trained model does better on the data that it has seen than it, it does on future examples. And the question that we keep asking throughout the semester is what does it mean to learn? And one answer for that was this idea of a mistake bound learning. A concept is said to be learnable in the mistake bound model if after only making a polynomial number of mistakes in the dimensionality, there are the, the, there will be no more mistakes. Um, and that there, there's a little bit more detail, but uh, the, about the you know the worst sequence of examples and all that. But that's uh, the, the let's get a, get you know let's not just go into that detail now. Mistake bound learning is just one way of asking: Can my concept be learned? Before we go into uh, uh, the rest of this lecture, are there any questions about what we've seen so far? This is just like a step back and uh, the uh, see where we are. There don't seem to be questions or Maybe this is such a high level that you don't particularly want to ask a detailed question, but you know, so, uh, I find it useful to kind of step back and think about where we've come, and uh, that's really why this is there. So, this unit is about computational learning theory, where I'll talk about the general notion of the theory of generalization. What does it mean for us to have a theory of generalization? It's not obvious that such a theory should exist. Um, just like it's not obvious that uh, there should be a theory for quantum mechanics. It's completely not obvious to me, but uh, um, even otherwise, you know, there are certain things that should there be any theoretical notion of learnability. Learnability seems like such an abstract idea, such a biological idea. How can there be a theory about it? So I'll talk about that. 
And then I'll talk about uh, this is uh, one model for uh, the theory of generalization called pack learning, probably approximately correct learning. And it pack learning is uh, uh, a certain learnability definition that was introduced by Leslie Valiant in 1984. And I think it is one of the cleanest definitions of learnability. Uh, using this model, we can prove certain concepts can be learned and certain concepts cannot be learned. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a bit. And then we'll start relaxing some assumptions that we make. So till here, we make an assumption that uh, the true concept, uh, the, the learning algorithm can uh, ex explore the hypothesis space that contains the true concept. In practice, we never know that. Like the question that came up, right? What if your data was not linearly separable? Or what if your uh, the true uh, classifier is not, uh, uh, cannot be, there exists no decision tree of depth five or lower that expresses the true concept. How do we uh, deal with that? Can we prove any theory in those situations? That's what agnostic learning is. If the learning algorithm explores a hypothesis space that need not contain the true concept, how bad could things be? And then we'll uh, move to one more level of uh, 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 abstraction where until, uh, until the point where we get to agnostic learning, we are working with uh, discrete features, Boolean functions or discrete functions. What if you have continuous functions like your perceptron, for example? Uh, how, do we, how do we kind of transport the theory that we've built so far to that? I expect by the time we get all the way down, we'll be past the spring break. So uh, it's going to be like a bit of an adventure. Okay. So let's uh, dive in. Did you have a question? Okay. So uh, we're going to talk about the theory of generalization where we'll talk about when we can trust the, a learning algorithm. And uh, we'll give a, uh, we'll revisit and uh, maybe slightly formalize the notion of the error of a hypothesis or a model. And I'll talk about batch learning and contrast it against online learning, which you've already seen. The underlying question for this entire line of thinking is, are there any laws of nature about learnability? What, what, what might such a law of nature uh, involve? What we want is some theory that connects the probability of successful learning, whether learning can succeed or not, with how many training examples are available, with uh, the complexity of the function that your function space that your hypo, that your learner is exploring, and how much accuracy you want, what does it uh, mean? If I care about uh, having a model that's hundred percent accurate versus ninety nine percent accurate versus sixty percent is good enough, and also how examples are uh, how the learning algorithm encounters the example. These are all different sort of moving parts, and what we would like is some theory that connects them all and uh, can say, this class of functions cannot be learned. This class of functions can be learned if you have these many examples and such things. So this is the hope. Let's look at uh, one example that we've kind of looked at before and I want to revisit it. Suppose I'm learning conjunctions. So imagine that my true conjunction is that thing at the top. It's the conjunction of X2 and X3 and X4 and X5 and X100. I have 100 features, but these are the only five relevant features that, uh, that matter. Nature knows this function, but does not, but chooses not to tell us. Instead, nature gives us a bunch of examples. It gives us these eight examples here, labeled examples. The way to read this is, this is your feature space, this is your set of features, and this is the label. So in this example, it's a negative example with all these features. Okay, so we have these eight examples. It turns out that if we already know that the true function that nature has is a conjunction, then learning this, learning from this data is kind of easy. We can essentially, what we can do is hide all the exa negative examples. So that takes care of half the data. Looking at only the positive examples, we go one feature at a time. Among all the positive examples, if a feature is always one, then it shows up in the class, in the in the learned function. If even one positive example has that feature value is zero, that 
that particular feature does not show up. Can someone tell me why this is reasonable for learning a conjunction? What is this zero doing that eliminates that feature? Yeah. Right. So for a conjunction, uh, remember what is a conjunction? A conjunction is a function that whose value takes true if and only if all its elements, components are true. So this particular feature, I think this would be x6. x6 is 0 and yet the label is 1. So there is no way x6 could have been in the conjunction. So we say that that particular example eliminates x6. Same argument for whatever this feature is uh, from that example, x98. There is no way x98 can be in the conjunction because had it been in the conjunction, the label would have been 0 because x98 is false. So x98 cannot be in the conjunction. So every you can go through every column. This algorithm that I'm describing, I'm putting algorithm in quotes here because it's technically, yeah, it's a program you can write, but it's so easy. Iterates over the features one at a time and just keeps only those features that are always one among the positive examples. But something curious happened here. The true function that we had had x2, x3, x4, x5, and x100. The thing that we learned has an extra x1. Why? Because it so happened that in the set of examples that we have, whenever the label is 1, x1 is 1. So x1 was never eliminated, so it survives. So then the question is, uh, notice that our hypothesis that we have is only an approximation of the true function. It's not identical to the true function because of this extra element. Is this good enough? How do we know that we've succeeded? If you want to get the exact function, then by a strict definition, this is a failure because we have an extra variable that did not exist in the mind of nature. Nature did not have an x1 here. There are two ways to go uh, forward from this point. Well, there's, there are three ways. One of those is not productive, but the, the, which is to say, learning has failed. There's nothing we can do. But more practically, what can we do? There are two ways to think about this. There is a certain probabilistic intuition here. Imagine that instead of eight examples, we had eight million examples. And among those 8 million examples, whenever the label is 1, x1 is 1. So we never saw x1 equals 0 with positive examples in such a large data set. Maybe we'll never see it again in the future. Maybe x1 is basically just uh, uh, you know, a copy of another feature. Maybe x1 is just uh, irrelevant. It doesn't really matter. So if even if it turns out that we have seen x1 equals the problem case is when x1 is x1 is 0 and label equals 1. And maybe this is such a rare event that even if we do, it happens so negligibly uh, infrequently that whatever we learn is going to be good enough for most of the time. And in terms of future performance, this intuition, this sort of an idea or extending this and taking this to its logical extreme gives us what's called the fact framework, which we will discuss next. But this is not the only way to reason about it. We've already encountered mistake-driven learning. Instead of thinking about whether we have learned the true concept or not, we don't care about the learning the true concept or not. All we care about is making mistakes in the future. And if after having encountered all these examples, we stop making mistakes, why do we care whether we've learned the true function or not? Any questions about these two slightly different perspectives? I would come to you, but I noticed that I'm only talking to you. So maybe we can wait for someone else to ask a question. So there is a question, which means there exists at least one question in the class. Can someone else reconstruct it? Or maybe you can. I don't know if this question is thinking, but uh, if we're so 
if we stop making mistakes, but still have an, an accurate model, because somehow we know what the model should be, uh -huh. and we're not making some mistakes, wouldn't that just mean that there's multiple correct models where it is possible there are a few ways of interpreting this. one of those could be that there are multiple correct models another way of interpreting it is the data that we are getting is itself biased we do not encounter all for the entire two power n features all the examples we encounter have a certain bias and we only encounter by examples where our model and the true model work together does it make sense Let's get to your question. This one? Yes. That is, a, that is the assumption that underlies all of fact learning. And we'll get into that right now. But uh, yes. So in some cases, right, we've already done that for perceptron, for example, R square over gamma square. Yeah. But notice that it, has, it uses this term gamma, which requires you to have already have access to the true uh, model. Uh, essentially, you can calculate that if you have some information about the tumor. Not always, but in some uh, okay. Yes. So, say if it has you have x1 plus a two zero in these examples, and then you incorrectly uh, make the prediction that that should be false because you sure. Is there some way you can use that to help you get a model? Okay, so this is an interesting question. The question is supposed to be in the test set. We have this thing where x1 is zero for a positive example. Can we use that to make our model better? In that particular instance, maybe you can, but I don't want you to think of your test set as a data set that can improve your model simply because the test set is supposed to represent the unseen future. So the minute you use your test set to update your model, it has become part of the training data and you no longer have a evaluation of the model in the future. So the test set is almost like it's a sacred object that you uh, don't touch. Uh, I have recommended, for example, my students to, when they get a data set, they take the test set, they compress the file, they make it a zip file and then unzip it only the day of the submission. Because not only is it a problem for your learning algorithm to look at the test examples. It could even be a problem if you, as a human, look at the test examples and accidentally leak information about test examples into your learner through your head by inventing features, for example. So don't even look at the test set. Don't let your model get influenced by the test set because none of us can actually look into the future and the test set is supposed to be that. In fact, that, that point is essentially getting into the question of setup, experimental setup for machine learning. Um, it, it, you need to be very, there are very few rules, but those are essentially hard. One of them is never look at your test set. So the mistake bound approach, it's a theoretical approach. In fact, the fact model is also a theoretical approach. And sometimes we may be able to determine how many mistakes uh, the, the model makes before converging on, before stopping, uh, uh, you know, before learning is successful. But it does not provide an answer to how many examples you need in order to uh, get to a good, good model. These are two different things. The mistake bound model says you need to have made these many mistakes. So I could say, for instance, you will, you, here is a learning algorithm that for some concept class will make no more than 100 mistakes. What I did not tell you is how many examples you need to see to actually make those 100 mistakes. Maybe to make those 100 mistakes, you need to have seen 100 billion examples. 
So the mistake bound model does not say anything about how many examples you need. Now, this is both a strength and a weakness. It's a strength because it makes no assumptions about the order in which examples are presented. Maybe you'll, you'll make your 100 mistakes the first 100 examples. Or maybe you'll make your 100 mistakes after seeing a billion examples. So it makes no assumptions. So it's essentially like a worst case behavior. It's a weakness because if I tell you that your self-driving car will get into no more than five accidents over the next year. I'm not going to tell you when those accidents will happen. Maybe it's like a scratch on a paint job. Maybe it's something really, really bad. Doesn't seem to be particularly uh, satisfying, does it? So the, sometimes we want to know a little bit more. We want to know how much, uh, how many examples you need to see and what kind of mistakes will be made in such things. And that's where pack learning comes in. Pack learning is a model for what's called batch learning. Batch learning is in some sense the standard uh, uh, the standard uh, mechanism with which machine learning is used in the wild today, uh, where you have a training set which is fixed and your learning algorithm gets to do whatever it wants with the training data. It, it can iterate over it many times. It can keep the entire set in memory, it can do whatever it wants, and then it produces a model. And then after it produces a model, it gets deployed. And the goal is, can we say something about how well the model will do on future examples? So let's start formalizing this a little bit. We have an instance space, X, which is the set of all examples. There's something called the concept space. It's a set of, uh, it's a set of functions that nature might have used to pick its true functions. And I'll call this C. So this is an assumption about nature, saying that I believe that nature used uh, K conjunctions to pick the concept. Or I believe that nature is operating with linear classifiers. A different set of functions, possibly a different set of functions, is called the hypothesis space, H, capital H. It's the set of all classifiers or all the hypotheses that your learning algorithm will explore. So these are two different things. Nature might have chosen its function from one set of functions, and the learning algorithm might be exploring a different set of functions. In a perfect world, you hope that these two are the same, but we never know. For now, we will assume that the hypothesis space and the concept space are identical, and then we'll drop that assumption later. The way we get access to the, the concept function, the true function, is in the form of labeled examples. Labeled examples. Uh, consists of pairs of xi and f of xi. Sometimes it's written as uh, a set S. S is a subset of the instance space, meaning it's a finite subset of the instance space. And to every example, there is a true function f that uh, we apply to that example to that instance, and we get a pair. So this would be the pair xn and f of xn. So we have a list of pairs. This is just a formal way of writing what we, you already have so far. Now the question is, what do we want to do with this? Our goal is to find a hypothesis. In fact, our goal is to find a hypothesis that makes the correct prediction. In other words, that, uh, that f of x and h of x are identical. But the question to think about is, do we want f and h to be identical on all the training examples? Or do we want them to be identical on the entire instance space or something else? What do people think? How many people say that our goal is to find a model that is perfect on the training data, which is this point here? How many, I see a few heads nodding. How many people say that our goal is to find a classifier that's perfect on the entire instance space. More hands. I see that some of you did not raise hands for either one. So there's something else here. Is there another option? Yes. Uh, I think you want to learn a hypothesis that can then zip into our observed space. What was the last thing you said? Well, we observe space and what we know it. Or what we will observe. So the third option that's being suggested here is. Um, there is this instance space, let's call this, this is this 
and the training set is a small subset here. And maybe you will observe in the future, you believe that there's something else that you'll observe that maybe some a bigger set, and that's the one that we care about. That's closer to what I was hoping. But essentially, we do we cannot hope that our true function will be identical to the learned classifier on the entire instance space, simply because what do we know? I mean, we've only seen a tiny subset, and maybe the entire set is, uh, uh, you know, th there are these odd examples that are rare, but that make our model wrong. I'm not, uh, there's a question. We, there's a suggestion. We would rather for all X in capital X, so the suggestion on Zoom is if we learn X, if we learn a classifier that is uh, uh, perfect, on just capital S, the training data, we would be overfitting or not generalizing well. Now, as a result, the reasonable thing to do is to say that we want our model to be identical to the true function on the entire X, on entire capital X instance space. Now, that is a reasonable thing to do. However, it is possible that the entire instance space does not, is not really, can, will never be observed or as uh, was suggested. Or it's possible that some elements on the instance space are so rare that we will never see them over like the entire lifetime of the classifier. Do we care whether the model gets the label right on those examples? Well, or maybe they are so rare that they occur only 1% of the time. Should we worry about that small tiny fraction in favor of the other 99% of the instances where uh, maybe the model is right? Yes. Uh, I think it depends on how with like how fast mistakes are That's true. Uh, for now, let's pretend that all mistakes are equal. A slightly different way of uh, uh, saying that your training set is a finite subset of the examples is to invoke this notion of a fixed but unknown distribution over the examples. So imagine that there's a probability distribution that's laid on top of the instance space. And I'll show an example of, of that in a bit. And that distribution dictates which examples are more common and which instances are less common. And you sample the distribution a finite number of times to get a finite training set. What we want, in fact, is our true function and the hypothesis that we have are equal on future examples that are drawn according to the same distribution. I'll give you an illustration of this in uh, with a two-dimensional instance space. Imagine that you have an instance space that looks like this box here. Um, I see the futility of drawing a box and saying this is what an empty box is what we have. But uh, imagine that all your training points are going to be points in the space. So every point here can be an, uh, an instance. So it's like a pair of uh, x. If you have x1 and x2, you have x1, x2 here, a pair of uh, numbers. Not all points in the space are equally likely to show up. And to kind of convince you that this is the case, suppose uh, your features represent, uh, 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 the features are some feature representation of say a document or of some images. Every sequence of words from the dictionary is not a document. A very small, you know, documents have to have some meaning. Every random coloring of pixels that you put on a make uh, in a rectangle is not a meaningful image for any of us. So instances, even though it may seem like all possible words combinations can be instances, in fact, some kinds of sequences of words are more likely to show up. Some kinds of sequence, uh, you know, uh, images are more likely to show up, images that occur in nature. So there is a certain distribution that exists over the instance space of what kinds of instances are more common, and what kind of instances are less common, and perhaps what kind of instances are impossible. I'm not saying we have access to that distribution. We just assume there exists a fixed distribution. So some, in other words, in this 2D example, for any point, there's a certain probability that that point is an instance or it's not. So it could look something like this, uh, uh, this image here. So or maybe as a contour plot, this point here is extremely likely to be an instance. 
this point here is likely this region there is no example for which this uh, this area will ever be a feature vector why because that's the that's the way nature opt uh, operates this is not a distribution that exists that we have access to but we are assuming that there is some uh, uh, process in nature that generates data our training data is a set of examples that's drawn from this distribution. Points that are more frequent, like at these peaks, will happen more often. Points that are less frequent will happen less often. Points that have zero probability will never happen. They are drawn, drawn IID. Have people seen IID before? If you have not, it is independent. And identically distributed. There are two, two things there. Identically distributed means all the points come from the same probability distribution. Independent means that your choice of one point does not influence whether some other point gets sampled or not. So every point is sampled independently from the same distribution. This finite set is going to be our training set. And not just this our, is this our training set, we are also going to make an assumption that all future examples are also going to come from this distribution. We are assuming that there is a fixed, possibly unknown distribution over the instance space that matter, that, so that generates the examples that matter. We Again, I want to make it very clear that we do not assume that we know what the distribution is. We will just assume that there exists such a distribution and it's not going to change over time. Meaning the data, the distribution that generated the training data is going to be the same uh, distribution from which future examples that your model will be evaluated on will be sampled on. Question. What would the changing distribution look like, for example, with like that distribution? Uh, I'll give you an example of a changing distribution, not with chatbot, but with just language in general. Language changes over time. Um, for example, uh, things like um, the president of a country changes over time. So, you know, and we talk about different things at different points of time. The composition of, say, um, the Kansas City Chiefs is different today from what it was two years ago. I think, I'm, maybe, I'm making it up, maybe it was. Um, but we talk, the, the, the topics of discussion change over time. The things that people talk about in 2023 is probably very different from what people spoke about in 1523. So language changes over time. The topics of conversation change over time. So the distribution over instances changes over time. And now for images, if you go around the world taking photos today, probably it's going to be very different from photos that you may have taken in 1523. Um, so again, there's a distribution over natural images, but that changes over time. We are making an assumption that may not always be true because language, all kinds of, uh, you know, imagine that you have a robot that is uh, navigating around the world and it can propel itself around any sort of things that we see today. And we wanted to work on Mars. You probably don't want to train your robot to kind of be able to navigate a classroom because it's a different distribution. So again, the, the distribution that the uh, the model co controlling the robot is different uh, in these two cases. Yeah. What would be one that would be the same? A classifier that I trained uh, for chat or emails last year is going to be close to my classifier that uh, that uh, on, on my emails this year, or a chat bot that was trained in 2021. Is surprisingly re relevant in uh, on data in 2021 is surprisingly relevant in 2023. Um, but in practice, this assumption is not always true because uh, I'll give you an example where the distribution does not change. Uh, imagine that I have a model that learns how to play chess. The rules of chess have not changed. So uh, if if they are if the game is encoded in the appropriate way, Distribution is not changing. So it's not like you know changing distribution. Uh, uh, every year we have a new set of chess rules. Other questions? 
Yes. Is it like just giving some property to some points and zero property to others, or is it like new more than zero? It's not. Uh, it's a proper distribution in the sense that it is there is a certain probability for every point existing. Oh, I can tell you examples of instances that exist and not exist. Um, I, can, I can even tell you examples of uh, things that are high and low. So the question was, uh, he says, uh, sorry, I forgot your name. Prashant. Prashant says, um, your, there are some points that can exist. I can see that. Some document exists. There are some documents that do not exist. Namely, just word salad. Put words together and mix it up. And it's not a real document. What does it mean for some instances to have higher probability than others? So are all topics equally likely to show up in a newspaper, for example? Have you ever seen any newspaper article about pack learning? It is probably more rare. It's nearly impossible, but um, you see my point. There was probably one article in New York Times about pack learning when Leslie Valiant got the Turing Award for it. But in general, it's, uh, it's an extremely rare thing. So certain topics are more common. Certain chess boards are more likely to show up because more people play those things. Certain chess boards are rarer because you are not, it's gonna take some effort to find yourself in such a position, right? Okay, this gives us, this sets us up, sets us up nicely for building the intuition for pack learning. Why do we need to, uh, this assumption that uh, of this fixed, but possibly unknown distribution? Doing, uh, making this assumption, gives us the ability or gives us the hope that our data, our, our model that we learn on this data set on a finite sample from this distribution will generalize in the future. So there, the, this is, the, in some sense, this gives us a hope that we will be able to generalize to unseen examples. I may not have seen this particular example, but I have seen other examples that are in the same part of the instant space. Why? Because my data is basically dominated with frequent things. It also turns out that as a technical point, and we'll see this uh, next, it gives us a formal definition of the error of a hypothesis. Um, I like to think of this assumption as uh, saying that the future where our model will be tested will be like the past. In the past, we have seen many examples, the same data that is sampled from this distribution. And because the future is like the past, any model that you build on the data of the past data will actually work in the future. In the example with the uh, feature X1 that we saw, in all the positive examples that we saw, the feature X1 was present. It's very likely that it's going to be present in all future positive examples also. But if it turns out that it's, uh, it, it shows up with a negative example or it, it has a value zero, no, it has a value one and the label is negative. It's going to be so rare because my entire training data was full of examples where X1 showed up with positive examples, which means that X1 not showing up with positive examples is a very rare event. Because it's a rare event, my classifier will make mistakes only infrequently. If errors are going to be so infrequent that I can live with it. I'm happy to make let it make those mistakes as long as my learning will work in a majority of the cases. Questions about this uh, idea? Yes. This idea of a in the example where uh, some and in our example space, we're looking for positive that. Like, are we learning about those, like, all 100 features, even if we're, like, 
are we being thinking about what x1 is and is there ultimately going to matter but like we are using x1 and all the other features in essentially the same way and our goal is not to learn about one feature or another but about the combination of them and how the, those or more importantly about how the combination of those features relates to the label that's all we care about we only care about learning a function that takes the combination of those input features to the label we are not learning anything about individual features Let me, the last thing I want to do today is to spend a bit of time talking about uh, the error of a hypothesis. The assumption of a fixed distribution over instances allows, it, allows us to define the error of a hypothesis. Imagine that we have some function h that we are entertaining currently. This may be the uh, classifier that our model has learned. This may be a classifier that our model is currently evaluating as a uh, as our learner is evaluating as a possible thing to uh, oh there's a question um, so the question was in the last bullet point should this have been inactive uh, i think yes you're right uh, it should have been inactive x1 is inactive only in a small percentage that's right good catch going back to the error um, so we have a hypothesis that we are currently evaluating or our learner has a hypothesis that it's currently evaluating. I, and we have a distribution over the example, a fixed but possibly unknown distribution over the instance space. The error of that hypothesis is simply the probability, the probability that the hypothesis and the true function disagree with each other. So in other words, h of x is not equal to f of x. But this probability is, whenever I say there's a probability uh, uh, over these things, there's an assumption of where the examples are drawn from, where x comes from. This is probability over the instances being drawn from the instance space, from, from that true distribution. In other words, in this error, an instance that is more likely to happen is weighted higher. The instance that's less likely to happen is weighted lower. An instance that's impossible gets a zero weight. An impossible instance, it does not matter whether h of x is equal to f of x because, or not equal to, because we will never encounter it. So the error, the true error of a hypothesis, we also call this the true error of the hypothesis. The true error of a hypothesis is the probability that h of x is not equal to f of x, where the probability is over the instance space, drawn, the instances being drawn from that true, dist true distribution. Here's a Sort of a cartoon example. Imagine that this box represents the instance space, and I have uh, the true function is a circle, the or this uh, circle-like thing that uh, assigns a label plus to everything inside and a label minus to everything outside. So everything inside the blue circle has been labeled plus. Now, based on some data that we have got, let's say our learn some learning algorithm learns a different circle, a slightly different circle. It learns a hypothesis that assigns a label plus to everything inside this uh, sort of slightly different blue circle. Notice that these two circles don't agree with each other. On these points, the true concept labels those points as positive because it's inside the dark blue circle, but our hypothesis labels it as negative. Here, the true concept labels it as negative because it's outside the blue circle, but our hypothesis considers them as positive. So those are the only instances where H and F disagree. And when I talk about this probability over the instance space, every point inside these regions, these two regions will have some weight or some probability of existing. And we are essentially accumulating all the probability over those areas alone. And that is the error of the classifier. In contrast to the true error, there's also something called the empirical error. The empirical error of uh, a classifier is simply the fraction of examples in your data where your model disagrees with the true function. You have a target concept F and we have a certain hypothesis H. 
The empirical error is defined over a training set or any set of examples that are sampled from a distribution. We no longer care about the distribution. We have a set of examples. So the fraction of examples, the fraction of elements of this S where S and F disagree is called the empirical error. We call this error S of H. And these two concepts, the true error and the empirical error, allow us to define overfitting formally. We've seen this before, but I want to restate this. When the empirical error on the training set is substantially lower than the generalization error of that classifier. So what that means is the training set makes it look like a certain hypothesis has a very low error. But when that classifier is used on examples that are drawn from the distribution, on future examples, this model, this classifier does worse. This means that the error, generalization error of a classifier is higher. And as a result, we say that our classifier has overfit on the training data. Our training data has confused our learning algorithm into thinking that a certain classifier is really good because it has no empirical error. And in fact, it's not because in generalization terms, our learner is uh, poor. The goal of batch learning essentially is to avoid overfitting. In other words, we want our learner, we want to design or invent learning algorithms that can that are not fooled by functions that just happen to look good because they look good on this training set. Because maybe if you change your training data, this function is not good. The last thing I want to do in the minute that's less, left is to contrast online learning and batch learning. In online learning, we make no assumptions about the distributions over examples. In batch learning, we have this fixed but possibly unknown distribution over the instance space. In online learning, learning proceeds as a sequence of trials where the learner sees an example, makes a prediction, and possibly corrects itself. In batch learning, examples are drawn IID from the training set and provided to the learner. The learner does whatever it does with it and produces a hypothesis. The goal of online learning or mistake-driven learning or mistake-bound learning is to limit the number of mistakes that the learner will make as it encounters the sequence of examples. The goal of batch learning is to find a hypothesis that has a low probability of making mistakes in the future. We are out of time, so I want to stop. Uh, if there are questions, please keep them in mind and we'll pick up from here uh, on uh, Tuesday. Don't forget your homework, don't forget the project thing and look out for homework three.